Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying Sasquatch encounters. Now, before I start, I want to let you know that on this channel, I like to share encounters that are more of a slow boil, that tend to create an atmosphere and a mood. If you're a fan of encounters like this, be sure to hit that subscribe button and turn on the notifications. I post new videos every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday, and if you have your notifications on, you'll be the first to know when those videos go live. All right, let's get right into it. On September 15th, 1975, Bigfoot put in an appearance in Brethead County, the creature was claimed to be around eight feet tall with a slightly human-looking hair-covered face. It fled into the woods when the witnesses stepped outside to investigate. The thing's mournful vocalizations have allegedly been heard by area residents on many occasions over the years and were said to sound like something from the pits of hell. Breathitt, like many other Kentucky counties, both near and far, has a history of reported monster activity. Over in Hazard on November 2001, a large, hairy, upright critter was seen crossing the road one night in front of startled motorists. Seventeen years earlier, in January 1984, small, barefoot, childlike footprints were discovered crossing a frozen creek in Jackson, Kentucky. No human children were reported missing from the area. The late Michael Paul Henson, well-known Kentucky writer and folklorist, wrote The Tragedy at Devil's Hollow and other Kentucky ghost stories of a bizarre skeleton found at Holly Creek, Kentucky. Brehead County, in 1965, which he was personally able to examine, that may or may not have some relation to the subject at hand. A man named Kenneth White while constructing cattle stalls under a large overhanging rock ledge near his home, came upon the perfectly preserved skeletal remains of what he at first took to be an Indian. As it was buried facing east, a well-known Native American custom, noticing some atypical aspects of the burial, White asked Henson to help further examine the strange bones, which were covered with a peculiar white, powdery substance that disappeared when touched. Upon reassembling the bones, the two were amazed to find that the unusual fellow in his life had stood at least eight feet nine inches tall. Moreover, the arms were abnormally long with large hands, while the feet of the being seemed small by comparison. The skull, the skull measured an astounding 30 inches in circumference, just 6 inches shy of a full yard. But the most unusual aspect of the skeleton was the facial structure, the likes of which neither had ever before seen or heard of. The eyes and nose sockets were slits, rather than cavities, and the area where the jawbone hinges to the skull was solid bone. Seemingly, this creature had never been able to open its mouth to eat or speak. No weapons, tools, or clothing remains were found in association with the bones, which, according to Henson's account, occupied a position five feet below ground, indicating that they had been placed there at least 300 years prior to their discovery. Strangely, Hansen related that the burial site looked only a few days old, with no sign of dark-colored soil usually associated with the decaying of human tissue. The two assumed the remains were those of an extraordinary large, deformed Indian. In the same area, some 20 years prior, a 60-pound, 
double-edged stone axe and a 20-inch long flint knife blade were plowed up by a local farmer, while later reburied the per- the peculiar bones and no official explanation of them was ever conducted. Henson died in March of 1995 without ever disclosing the exact location of the burial site. Another early account as recorded by Henson comes from Brehit County in 1935. Three trappers, James Collins, Will Gus Pratter, and Dale Carpenter were out checking a trap line they had lain in a remote section of Quicksand Creek when they found that all of their traps had been sprung, but were empty. Every single animal had either escaped, been freed, or was stolen from their traps. This was mighty perplexing to them, so the three men decided to stake out a large stretch of line overnight to find out what was happening to the traps and kill the animal responsible. They rebaited the traps and later that evening stationed themselves about 300 feet apart beneath a long, rocky overhang where most of their caches had been lost and began their vigil. They all agreed to signal the others if they saw anything with a single gunshot. That night passed without incident, as did the second night of surveillance. But their patience was rewarded when, at 1 a.m. on the third night, Pratter saw a figure quietly approaching the trap line. It was walking upright in the moonlight, and as it approached nearer to his position beneath the ledge, apparently unaware of his presence there, Pratter saw that it was a large, hairy, man-like animal. Hardly believing his eyes, Pratter waited until the creature was within 20 feet of him, then raised his 30 30 rifle and pumped three shots straight into the thing. At the sound of the first shot, both Collins and Carpenter hurried to join their friend. They arrived just in time to hear whatever Pratter had shot as it thrashed around in the thick brush. They then approached to within what they thought was 25 feet of the animal making these sounds and opened fire. Between the three of them, they reportedly fired off 20 bullets in the direction of the thrashing sounds, after which all was quiet and still. The beast was likely dead, they reasoned. They hadn't heard anything running away from the area. Even so, they decided to wait until daylight before entering the woods to search for its body. At dawn, the party searched the area but found nothing. No tracks, no blood, and no trail. Nothing to indicate that the creature had ever really been there at all. These men were honest, sober woodsmen, Henson stated, who did not relate their experience until much later. All three were expert shots and swore until they died that they had fired over 20 rounds at a huge, hairy animal at a distance of less than five yards without killing or apparently even hitting it. Paul Henson, without a doubt, believed in the existence of Bigfoot. His own grandfather, father, and two uncles had encountered one back in 1910, which, no doubt, left quite an impression on him, and he would later wrote of the events in more Kentucky ghost stories. The four men had gathered at Henson's huge four-room log cabin to play poker one rainy, gloomy Friday night in October of that year, when a violent thunderstorm struck. The rain pelted the cabin, and the wind seemed intent on pushing down the very walls. The game wore on, though, as the lightning flashed outside the windows, and the thunder boomed above their heads. Suddenly, from outside, there came a blood-curdling, high-pitched scream, the likes of which they'd never heard before, and so alarming that it nearly paralyzed the entire group. 
There was only one thing to do. They immediately grabbed up their shotguns and thus armed raced out into the storm in the direction of the scream. As they neared a field close to the house, the flashes of lightning revealed a huge, white, hairy figure standing there in the darkness. Nearly simultaneously, all four men raised their shotguns and fired. What happened next was completely unexpected and no doubt the source of much conjecture and debate for many years afterwards. Instead of falling to the ground dead from gunshot wounds as anything else would have done, the large white figure seemed to just evaporate right before their eyes. Stunned by what they had just witnessed, the Henson family walked over to where the creature was standing, but they could find nothing there. The next morning, after the storm had passed, they went back to the field to look for any sign of what they had shot at the previous night. Much to Henson's alarm, they found four of his prize hogs lying dead in a heap near the spot. On examination, it appeared that most of their bones in their body had been cruelly broken and all their throats had been cut, as if with a knife. Perhaps even more curious, if possible, was the complete absence of blood at the scene. Another rainy night, this time several weeks later, offered the men one opportunity to discover the true nature of the critter, and this time they were ready when they heard that awful scream issue once again from the field outside. They rushed out to the field, and staying close together, began to search for the source of the alarming vocalization. They walked a good distance out into the field when they saw the same white figure as before. It seemed not to know that the men were near, or, if it did, was completely ignoring them. This time, all four men took careful aim at the creature, again Four shots blasted out a hail of lead that would kill anything. The beast let out another unearthly scream and vanished into thin air once again. Now, there was no doubt whatsoever about the ghostly nature of the creature. Nothing natural could have survived the veritable hail of bullets they'd unleashed upon it. The next day, they returned and found another hog in the exact same condition as the previous ones, lying in the same spot where the creature had stood. They also found several large, deep, three-toed footprints, which they could never explain. According to Henson, the white Bigfoot creature was never seen or heard there again. According to author slash investigator and friend, the late Mary Green, a lone motorist, saw Bigfoot in his headlights on the night of November 7th, 2001, while driving through Hazard, Kentucky. The witness claimed that he saw an 8-foot to 9-foot tall hairy beast as it crossed the road in front of him at around 7 p.m. that evening. He described it as a cross between a monkey and a bear with very dark colored fur. It made sounds like that of a very big bear, he said. After he arrived at the spot, he claimed that he stopped the car and got out to investigate, only to find a line of footprints some 20 inches in length along the roadside. My dad told this story to me, when me and my first wife came for a visit from Oregon. In 1990 or 1991, Dad and his common-law wife at the time were living in Cloverport in a trailer up on the old m &L Landfall Road off Highway 92, right at the top of this steep hill. He had told me of this very strange sound he heard up there, a type of scream or something but it raised the hair on the back of his neck so bad that he wouldn't go out of the trailer at night unless he could see very well. 
He also said there was a lot of strange things going on out there. There was this awful type smell, kind of like an old dead dog, very stinky. I have walked that road before, and to me, it wasn't that much fun. It's like someone or something is watching you. My dad is gone now, but I know he wasn't into telling lies. Two more late night motorists got an eyeful of the unknown while driving through Cloverport, Kentucky in Breckenridge County. Me and my son were driving down a country road around 11 p.m. on December 21st, 2007, writes Jim. We had just turned around and were heading back to the city when we both saw something out of the passenger side window. We both said, what was that at the same time? I stopped the truck and backed up and could see a large object about 80 yards away from the truck. As we backed up, the object continued to look at us. I stopped the truck, rolled down the window, and shined a flashlight at the object. It then slowly turned and walked into the woods. We went back to town and got a friend of mine and went back out to the spot where we had seen the object. We walked down to the edge of the woods and all of a sudden we heard this growl or roar. Just as we stood frozen, we could hear it walk deeper into the woods. Jim described the object as about six and a half to seven feet tall. Its entire body was covered with fur. It walked upright like a man and didn't seem to be in any hurry at all. Nighttime yowler activity has also been reported for at least 20 years from the same general area. On November 2nd, 2014, two women were sitting on the porch of their home in rural Breckenridge County. It was about 6.45 p.m., when one of the women saw a large branch in a nearby tree line being pulled down, then released. On further scrutiny, she saw a tall, blonde-colored figure with wide shoulders and no neck, standing on two legs beneath the tree. She then yelled to the other woman. Her daughter-in-law then exited the porch and saw it plainly herself. The creature then turned around and it ran away into the trees. I've never in my life seen anything move so fast, one of them later said. The most notable feature about its face was the hair. It looked like long, wind-blown fur around the face, which was a chalky gray color when it turned and the sunlight hit it. Both witnesses agreed that the creature's shoulders were about four feet wide and rounded like a bodybuilder's. Just after dark, two days later, on the 4th, her husband saw a different creature. This one, solid black in color, walking across the backyard. It was eating something from its hand, he claimed. It had one hand cupped and held up at chest level, while, with its other hand, it picked up the items, whatever they might have been, and placed them into its mouth. It moved quickly, and the witness only got a passing glance at the thing. It was tall, hairy, and black, he said. Two days later, it was observed again in the backyard this time, standing behind a trailer. It was three feet taller than the trailer, the latest witness claimed. Two days later, and only six days after the initial sighting, a couple of local investigators looked at the scene and concluded that the first creature, the blonde one, had stood between seven and nine feet tall. I hope you enjoyed those stories, and if you did, be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell. I post new videos every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday, and if you have your notifications on, you'll be the first to know when those go live. Again, thank you so much for watching the video, and until next time, bye!